Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending July 11th. First up, this is from the Wall Street Journal. GoPro shrinks the camera again. Hero 4 session review. If you take a look at this, the first thing I saw when I saw this session was I thought, GoPro, all they did was just come out with a Polaroid cube that's been out for quite a while. Only the kind of scary thing about it is they uh, are pricing it at $399 versus the Polaroid Cube at uh, $99. They did add some things to it. Now, I'm not, that's just my impression. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just, I guess there's no patent on making something into a cube shape, but it sure looks like it. And you can compare the pictures of them here. I'll put them uh, both up. But they did add some things to it. They added a uh, making it waterproof without a case. If you get the Polaroid Cube, you have to buy a case to make it fully waterproof. And they uh, improved the sound of it. They made it so that when you dip it into the water and then it comes out of the water, it drains the water out in the microphone sound. There's some uh, links and demonstrations to how it works. If you uh, take a look at the whole article here, and you can also even just uh, do a search on YouTube about the GoPro sessions, and you'll see um, a lot of people giving demonstrations and stuff like that. I still, for $99 for the Polaroid Cube versus $399 for the GoPro, and GoPro even admits themselves it's not as good a sensor as their regular GoPro cameras, their latest ones, so I think that means they're using some of the older sensors out of the other cameras. Um, although I'll have to say the picture looks still pretty nice. I mean, if you look at the people that are posting it on YouTube, the picture's uh, a very decent uh high definition picture, but uh, I don't know. I just don't see a lot of them selling for $399. Would any of you be willing to pay $399 to get a little uh, ice cube sized GoPro camera even if it was waterproof? And next up, this is from CNN News. Crash at NASCAR race at Daytona injures fans. I'm going to loop this video here and have you guys look at it. This is a really nice lesson in physics. This fence that they have, this protective fence, I had never seen it really work to this level of effectiveness before. Now, I haven't followed NASCAR in a couple of years, so maybe this is something that's happened before, but it looks to me like this car was literally launched into this fence by uh, some kind of a device or something like that, or some kind of a catapult just launched this thing into the fence, and uh, it stayed put on the tracks. Now, some of the debris did scatter into the audience, and some people had to be medically examined, and I think one person was taken to the hospital in stable condition, but this is something that I would have thought... Um, looking at it before it hit the fence that somebody would have been, uh, or several somebody's would have been killed. And even, as a matter of fact, after this was done and the car bounced off of the fence, landed back on the track upside down, the driver walked away from the crash. So um, kudos to the engineers that designed the safety at NASCAR. That is rather amazing to see that level of uh, energy being diverted into different directions and still having uh, nobody end up uh, killed from it or anything like that and only one person even having to be taken to the hospital. And this one is from Consumerist.com. If you buy the stuff no one else likes, you may be a harbinger of failure. This really reminds me of some of the different things I've gotten involved in over the years. I tend to buy those kind of products, too, that don't seem to last really long. I think it's a really great idea, but um, I guess, you know, it doesn't really end up lasting that long. I bought those uh, things called Super Discs. It was the same size as the little uh, five and a quarter inch uh, floppy discs. They used to be in your computer. They had these super disks that held uh, way more. I think it was like more than 10 times more, and I thought it was such a great idea. And then six months later, that was dead. I bought the uh, um, those little mini disk players that were like uh, little tiny CDs and a plastic permanently into a plastic case that recorded something like 74 minutes of music. I thought that was great. And then within about a year, the MP3 players took over, and those things were pretty much dead except for I guess some people still over in Europe and stuff like that used them for quite a while longer, but I've bought projects, products like that all. But uh, listen to the article here. In a study published in the Journal of Marketing Research, researchers identified particular kinds of consumers whose preferences can predict products that will flop, calling those folks harbingers of failure. Certain customers systematically purchase new products that prove unsuccessful, wrote the study authors. These early adopt their early adoption of new products is a strong signal that a product will fail. In other words, they can track these people, and pretty much by just tracking this subgroup of people, they can really um, find out if a product's going to succeed or not. Researchers looked at retail purchases made by 130,000 consumers at a national convenience store chain and found that 13% of them had buying habits that predicted failure of a new product. Failure in this case means surviving less than three years. About half or more of the products they bought were doomed to die before they had a chance to make it big. This means that if you're that kind of person, 
who liked the Zune, you probably also liked Frito-Lay lemonade. No idea what that is, which apparently was a thing. And the more they buy, the less likely the product will succeed. So that might be really just as good as tracing what's going to succeed, tracing what's going to fail by getting the right level of, or uh, the right group of consumers together that buy stuff like this. Uh, I tell you, for uh, a few products along the way, I could have been that kind of person. And the New Horizons spacecraft, just as I finished my report last week, they ended up having a glitch. I guess the processor was trying to process compressing one set of files and processing another kind of files, and it went into uh, processor overload, and then it went into safety mode, which means for a while it didn't communicate back with NASA, but I guess everything's worked out now. It went into safe mode like it should. An hour later, they were able to regain communications, and they're on track to do that now. Rather than today look up and give you some pictures of Pluto as they're on their way. I'm going to actually wait. It's uh, two more days now. Today is the 12th, so it's two more days. They're going to be closest to Pluto, so I'll save that for next week's show. But evidently, even with the scare, it's like everything's totally back to normal. There was a, the, the way they worded it, some of the people were thinking that maybe it had gone off course or something like that, and it was just a part of the news conference that they used the wrong wording that people didn't understand. But everything's on course. Everything's ready to go. No hardware, no software is... Uh, is damaged whatsoever, and it looks like if everything uh, stays the way it is, that uh, in two more days we're going to have some really nice pictures of Pluto, and uh, maybe next week I'll get a chance to share some of those uh, for you. Whatever is available, I'll try to put up next week in my show. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week. <laughs>